Hello and welcome to the Education Connections webinar, 20 Years of Promoting Academic Language and Literacy with the SIOP Model, Past, Present, and Future. My name is Lindsay Massoud and I will be moderating tonight's session. We are delighted to be joined this evening by current and former colleagues, Deborah Short and Jennifer Himmel. Dr. Deborah Short directs Academic Language Research and Training, a consulting company, and provides professional development on sheltered instruction and academic literacy worldwide. She formerly served as a division director at the Center for Applied Linguistics, where she co-developed the SIOP model. Jennifer Himmel is the director of pre-K-12 ELL professional development programs at the Center for Applied Linguistics. A former middle and high school content-based ESL teacher, she oversees research-based professional development activities and technical assistance to schools, states, and districts in the United States and abroad, and leads professional development activities in the SIOP model for over 50 schools or districts annually. Thank you, Deborah and Jen, for being with us this evening. We'd like to extend a warm welcome to everyone who's been able to join us today for our second Education Connections webinar of the 2016 to 17 school year and our 19th webinar in our ongoing series of live events. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We'll begin today's session with a brief introduction and an overview of Education Connections. Then we'll hear from Deborah Short and Jennifer Himmel. Following their presentation, we'll have a brief time reserved from some questions and comments from participants. We'll be monitoring these as they come in, and we encourage you to send along any thoughts or questions that come to mind during the presentation using the questions box in the GoToWebinar window. During today's session, we'll also be posting some polling questions related to your background and today's topic. When results are in, we'll post them for you to view. We also invite you to chat further about today's topic by joining us on Twitter. You can use the hashtag EdConnex, E-D-C-O-N-X, to participate in the conversation with Education Connection staff and your fellow educators. For those of you who may be new to Cal's Education Connections, we wanted to briefly introduce you to the community and resources available. Education Connections is an initiative of the Center for Applied Linguistics in collaboration with the University of Oregon. It is hosted on the University of Oregon's Obaverse platform. Education Connections is a free online community providing access to a wide range of resources and bringing educators together to collaborate around implementing high quality standards based instruction with all students and especially English learner students. There are many different ways to participate in Education Connections. You can share ideas and ask questions in the discussion forums, find resources to use in your classroom, participate in live events such as this one, and read Tuesday's tips and Friday's fun facts that are shared in the forums every week. Anyone is welcome to join, so we invite you to sign up today if you're not already a member. As a reminder, the Education Connections team will post a video archive of the webinar, a PDF of the PowerPoint, and links to resources related to today's webinar. To access these resources, log on to Education Connections and click on the Live Events tab. On your screen, you'll now see a couple of polling questions regarding your background, and we'll post results when these commit. The first question we'll ask is, what is your current position? Are you a general education teacher, an instructional coach, or teacher educator? Are you an ELL, ESOL, ELD, or bilingual teacher, or a coordinator or administrator, or do you have a different role? So it looks like we have a lot of ELL teachers as well as instructional coaches and a few coordinators or administrators as well. So welcome to all of you. We're so glad you could join us. We also wanted to know how familiar are you already with PSYOP? Are you not at all familiar, somewhat, or very familiar? So it looks like we mostly have people who are very familiar and somewhat familiar. Um, so at least all of you have heard of SIOP. Maybe a number of you are implementing SIOP in your instruction already. So it's great to hear, and we'll do a little bit more learning together about SIOP tonight. 
Great, so I am now going to turn it over to Deborah and Jen to share with you about PSYOP. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. I see from the list of participants some longtime friends and hope that Jen and I will make some new friends on this webinar as well. We're delighted to celebrate 20 years of the PSYOP model, talk a little bit about the past, share with you some of the things that are happening presently, and maybe get some of your ideas for the future as well as things that we would love to do. For those of you, and most of you are familiar with PSYOP, or at least very or very familiar, um, you'll know that we like to have content and language objectives not only in all of our lessons, but also in our workshops. So our hopes tonight is that we'll give you a deeper understanding of the PSYOP protocol as an effective tool for lesson planning and for teaching our learners, but also um, spend some time talking about effective professional development, both in getting teachers to start doing PSYOP, but the more important thing is how do we sustain it so that teachers can do it well consistently and with um, effectiveness. In terms of our language objectives, we're going to give you some chances in this highly interactive virtual community to summarize some of the main points of SIAP as you see them, and also to observe and listen to a video clip of some co-teachers who use the SIAP model and then reflect on the instructional practice that's, that they um, they're sharing with us. So just want to um, have this little celebration. When we started the PSYOP model with our first research project back in 1996, we never imagined it would last more than the original five years of the funding. But Jenna Cheveria and Mary Ellen Vogt um, at Cal State Long Beach and myself here at Cal with all of our um, battery of research assistants and um, collaborating teachers really um, appreciate all the work that's gone on to keeping PSYOP alive and making sure that the bottom line that we all care about, which is student success, actually comes to fruition. So I just want to talk a little bit about how PSYOP has moved from the past to the present. And those of you that were involved in education in the 90s, you know that we had quite a bit of standards-based reforms going on, although it wasn't until the end of the 90s that we had standards for ESL. But during that time, we knew that our students were um, exiting from programs and not being as successful in the mainstream classrooms or the gen ed uh, classrooms. And then, of course, when 2001 came along, we had NCLB that got enacted um, officially in schools that following year. So we had a lot of academic rigor uh, put upon our English language learners. They were asked to have much more content uh, instruction and also testing, which was problematic in some cases. But the plus side was that more and more teachers realized they need to develop the effective strategies to work with second language learners when they were integrating language and content. And then most recently we have ESSA in front of us and it will be implemented next year and it will continue the standards-based reforms and some of the testing. So we have to keep vigilant in the best ways that we can serve our English learners. And it's in the context of this educational reform that we first developed the PSYOP research. As I mentioned before, our first a research study started in 1996, and we were just trying to find out what were some effective instructional practices. We didn't quite realize at that point it would grow into a full model for um, an instructional approach, both for lesson planning and for lesson delivery, and that it could cross all grade levels and um, a number of different types of classroom environments. We then, after we, uh, towards the end of that research study, we received additional funding to work on PSYOP implementation. Some of you may remember the original Blue Book, which was the first edition of making content comprehensible and the Cal videos and training manuals that came out. But what's important and what we in many ways want to acknowledge tonight is that PSYOP research has continued all of this time. And we continue to find both ourselves as the original developers, as well as a number of other, um, hopefully some of you even who are on the webinar with us tonight, people who have done research, whether it's through their dissertations, through other funded studies, and that's showing that SIOP is effective. And then similarly, SIOP has been implemented uh, during all this time and continues to be implemented. My understanding is we have had SIOP 
workshops in all 50 states, in a number of the territories, and it's also in a number of different countries. So it really has had this longevity, and um, it's because of teachers like you, educators like you, that um, have embraced it in many ways and then implemented it in really effective ways. So the other thing that I'd really like to just start out tonight is point out to you that we have not changed the model. In the 20 years, well, probably in the 15 years since we published the first book, because the first four years we did adjust the protocol and the number of features, but we really haven't changed the components um, and the features in all this time. So it's, it's solid. You know, it has worked for teachers and for students, and the students are very being successful, both in terms of their language development and their content achievement. I'm going to turn it over to Jen now to talk with you a little bit more. All right, so I'm going to talk, I mean, we talked a little bit about who's in the room. Um, virtually, and we have several um, people who are very familiar and then somewhat familiar, so I just want to get us on the same page about what is PSYOP. So it's a research validated framework for helping educators plan and deliver lessons that integrate content and academic English language development. Thus, our definition of PSYOP would be, or sheltered instruction would be, a means for making grade level academic content like science, social studies, math, um, more accessible for our English learners while at the same time promoting their English language development. There are eight components and 30 features to the SIOP model. All eight components have empirical studies that support them and then of course the model itself has a solid research base that we will um, unpack a little bit more in this, this webinar. Um, the model includes features that are recommended for high quality instruction for all of our learners and it also has features that are very specific to children um, who are learning um, in a new language, such as providing opportunities for integrating and practicing all four language skills, and then also having educators think about how they can create and then implement language objectives that help their students develop both content and language proficiency. So in thinking about how to make this, inter this webinar a little bit more interactive, we wanted to try out something with you. This is called an elevator speech. Um, it's something that we sometimes do in SIOP workshops to model for teachers how they can implement instructional techniques that will develop academic language as well as content knowledge. So what we're going to ask you to do is imagine that you, maybe you're at a conference, a conference about English learners, and you're riding up to the 20th floor of a hotel and someone says, well, what is PSYOP anyway? Or how do you use it? So what we'd like you to do is think in your head how you would describe PSYOP to that person in that short time that you have. You have 20, 20 floors, right? So maybe quick, quickly jot down some words or phrases that you'd want to include in this elevator speech. And because it is an elevator speech, you have to keep it short. When you're ready, what we'd like you to do is go to the questions box within the GoToWebinar window and go ahead and, and post your response there. If you just have bullet points, that is okay. What we're going to do as those posts come in is we'll go through them, we'll find some themes, and you can kind of compare your response to what the other participants in this webinar are thinking. So go ahead and see if you can quickly jot down an elevator speech about PSYOP. Okay, so we've got some responses coming in. Thank you so much. Keep them coming. I'll go over a few of them as everyone else is 
is posting theirs. So a couple of themes that I see coming through is it's an instructional um, planning, it's a tool for classroom instruction, um, a way to reach all learners in your classroom. I'm also seeing SIOP uh, conceptualized as a framework in helping um, teachers support the learning of academic language. Um, we see some differentiation, some attention to differentiation within SIOP. Um, a research-based program for helping ELs integrate content language with all eight components and 30 features. And I see scaffolding come through quite a bit in your, um, in your elevator speeches. Excellent. We'll see if we can get a, maybe a couple more. Um, another theme that's coming through is a, a way to organize and also a way to assess, which is an excellent thing to point out. All right. So what I'd like to have us do is just think a little bit about this activity. You did this really fast. I appreciate you um, bearing with us here. So if we were doing an elevator speech with our students, we might in a SIOP workshop have teachers think about, well, so how did this encourage participation? Um, and if you have some ideas, you can go ahead and put those ideas there in the question box too. Um, some things that we've heard teachers say is, well, it gives um, your students time to plan before they have to orally speak, and so that's an excellent way of, of getting um, learners familiar with the content and the language that they have to produce. Other aspects that might be good for English learners um, is that they can hear what others think and then they can modify their own um, elevator speech so they might refine it based on what they hear from a partner or from a, um, someone else in the room. And then in terms of how we can incorporate this or we can um, adapt it, um, some teachers, they may use it for practicing summarization, which is a very important skill and one that ELs have to continue to work on. Um, and it can also be a way to kind of do an elevator or an uh, exit ticket at the end of a lesson. I also see in our um, chat box that teachers feel it could be a, a quick way to synthesize complex ideas, which I agree with. <laughs> All right. So, you know, how does one use PSYOP? So, what we'd like to have us think about is PSYOP can be used for multiple um, things as a tool. Obviously, it helps teachers plan their lessons um, so that they're integrating both content and language. Um, and we're going to talk about how it helps improve teaching in a moment, but that's another way. Teachers can, it's a way for teachers to reflect um, on their instruction, and it gives them a language to do that. And that, that reflective language is also um, facilitated through peer coaching. So the protocol itself can help uh, teachers who have critical friends in a building, help them think about what's going well and what aspects of their lesson design and delivery they like to enhance. It's also a way to foster staff development in a building to provide in-service teachers with opportunities for extended learning. We know that a lot of our in-service teachers do not get enough time in their pre-service programs to um, talk about and think about how to reach our culturally and linguistically diverse students. And it's also a way for um, school districts and schools to really organize their curriculum and their existing professional development. So it's really tailored uh, for the EL. So it's a way to kind of organize the site model components and features help school districts organize um, their school improvement plans for English learners. And of course, we can use it in our pre-service programs to help new and future teachers understand how to work with English learners. And I'm going to turn it over to Deb. Thanks, Jen. I'm wondering, go, you know, thinking about that list, how many of our participants have used the PSYOP as a tool in most of those ways over the, uh, particularly if they've been long-term PSYOPers, probably. They've all experienced the, the different means for making PSYOP useful with their teachers that they're working with. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the research that we've done, and just to reinforce the notion that PSYOP is ongoing and PSYOP does have uh, valid measures of effect Many of you know that um, the um, first study 
had a uh, couple of different pieces to it. And one was obviously that if we were going to have a protocol that we were using to measure classroom implementation, then we had to make sure that it was valid and reliable. And so the Journal of Research and Education uh, published the uh, first study with regard to this by Tony Guarino and found that SIOP is indeed highly reliable and a valid measure of sheltered instruction. So that's where as a researcher you sort of rub your hand across your forehead and you say, whew, okay, so we can work with this, you know, this is a good tool. And I know that since then other research studies have um, used uh, the SIOP itself or a modified version of the SIOP because it is a standard for um, sheltered instruction now. Uh, a second finding that was published in the Journal of Educational Research was where we looked at student achievement. So some of you know that we had teachers build the model with us in the initial research study and then we had some of the co-builders, as it were, as well as other teachers in their districts look at uh, implementing the SIOP and then measure student performance on a writing exam. Now, if you look at the date here, you'll notice that this is prior to NCLB. So we didn't have our students participating in standardized state testing at this point. But Illinois, if there's anybody here from Illinois, here's a little shout out for you, had a wonderful assessment. It was called the image exam, the Illinois measure of annual growth in English that was given to all the ESL students in the state of Illinois from grades three up to measure their level of language development. But the wonderful thing about it, it was a benchmark test. So if students reached a certain level of performance, the educators knew they had enough English language to then take the regular state tests in um, English language arts or in mathematics. So instead of testing the students before they had English that could help them understand the test, they actually measured that. That's a wonderful thing. I'd love to see happen again in the U.S., across the U.S. But in the meantime, we use the image writing exam to see how students in our classrooms with teachers who were trained in the model performed compared to um, other classrooms in the districts that had similar students but teachers who had not been trained in the model. And what you can see from here are the pre-test and post-test scores from the SIOP group and the comparison group. And these are the average mean scores, obviously. But the pre-test, you can actually see that the SIOP group on average scored lower than uh, the comparison group, but on the post-test, they had significant gains. And what you can see here are just how those gains were more than double for the SIOP group compared to the comparison group. However, we, we were this was promising for us, but it wasn't a magic bullet. Because even as you look on this slide and you look at the y-axis, you see it goes up to, um, actually this axis better, up to 3.5, but this exam could go all the way to a 5. So the students were gaining, and they were gaining more than students who didn't have SIOP, but they weren't all of a sudden proficient in writing after one year. The other thing to keep in mind with this initial study is most of these students only had one teacher in their entire day who was working on SIOP with them. We then scaled up the study and we were fortunate enough to work with two different districts in northern New Jersey, one of which implemented the SIOP at their two middle and high schools and the other one that acted as a comparison district for us. We ramped up SIOP PD here, especially because we didn't have the teachers who helped develop the model with us here. We were taking it out uh, cold, as it were, but we also instituted some on-site coaching and we provided some online web support, both in terms of resources and and chat rooms and things over the course of time. We did observations twice a year in the SIOP classrooms and in the comparison classrooms. We also collected SIOP lesson plans uh, to see if teachers were able to implement it in their planning, even if the actual delivery might be a step behind because they were still learning the model while we were doing this assessment and research for them. And we looked at state tests. At this point now, it was after NCLB, so the students were participating in their ES cell test, which at that point was the IPT, the Ideas Proficiency Test, and Math, Science, History, and Reading, as you can see. We were able to publish this study in the TESOL quarterly and had some key findings, one about teacher development, which I think is important for us to remember. Again, teachers aren't uh, learning to be high implementers of the SIOP in just a summer institute or a month of uh, you know, a workshop here or there. It took our teachers one to two years to become really high level implementers. And it also required some sustained professional development that not only spread those workshops 
out across the year, but also provided that coaching and um, supports inside the, the school where they were working. We then looked at the student performance and after one year, we were able to find statistically significant differences for the PSYOP students within the district. So when we compared those who had PSYOP teachers in the PSYOP district with students who did not have teachers who had taken the PSYOP professional development yet, we found um, quite a bit of growth for those with the PSYOP teachers. It, we were looking at the comparison at that point, but we didn't have statistical significance until the second year. So by the second year, our, PSYOP, our students in PSYOP classrooms were outperforming the students in the comparison classrooms. And I just have a few slides to show this with you. I mentioned earlier that New Jersey at this point, before it became a WIDA state, was using the IPT. And here is the oral um, mean scores for the PSYOP and comparison group. 2003 to 2004 was our baseline. We didn't start working with the districts until the summer of 2004. So um, this was prior then to any kind of professional development. You can see the PSYOP treatment group was starting to pull away from the comparison group after one year, but it was after the second year that the statistical significance was uh, evident in their oral scores. Here's a graph of the reading scores. And as you can see, the comparison district was actually doing a bit better than our PSYOP district at the baseline level. They were coming closer together in, after one year, and then the treatment district surpassed the comparison district after two years. It didn't reach statistical significance, but it was approaching significance. We also looked at the writing scores, and the writing scores were kind of a mix of the two. So the comparison group was a little ahead at baseline. Uh, after one year, the treatment district had outperformed, but the statistical significance happened in the second year. So in comparing this, again, we, it pointed out to us that you really needed to think more long term. It wasn't a type of intervention that teachers could just pick up and do the next day and do successfully with student uh, achievement. The teachers were learning the PSYOP model, particularly in that first year. By the second year, most of them were good implementers, and that's where we saw those gains. The IPT also gives a total score, and what was interesting here is there was actually a statistically significant gap at the baseline level with the comparison district doing better. Um, the PSYOP district caught up in the first year and by the second year that was also a statistically significant. So again, we had moved from our initial research in the middle school to this research in middle and high schools and SIAP continued to be a promising um, intervention for students. The teachers, again, I mentioned earlier, they had these different levels of implementation and we were lucky with the um, PSYOP district to have two cohorts of teachers. The first cohort worked with us for two years, and as you can see, they improved in their levels of implementation over the course of the two years. The second cohort came in only in the second year, and they did quite well. And in our interviews with the teachers, one of the things that they said was, well, I came into a school where teachers were already doing PSYOP. In my department, teachers were talking about it. They were planning lessons. So I felt I had some support, not only from the coaches, but but also from the teachers and my colleagues here. As you can see, the comparison district did not have many teachers who did the uh, PSYOP. Now again, the comparison districts weren't trained in PSYOP, but as many of you know who have looked at the protocol, a number of the features you'd find in any good pre professional development for ESL teachers or teachers who have who are working with ESL students. So there was some there was some evidence of it. Our um, more recent study was with the CREATE National Research Center, which was um, housed at the University of Houston, and we did a randomized experiment at this point. So we had a PSYOP, treat, PSYOP treatment groups as well as control groups. But to um, change up the research a little bit, we focused on eighth and, uh, seventh and eighth grade science. So we really wanted to drill down a little bit and see if we could help the teachers with one particular area. So we developed curriculum units that were PSYOP science based on the district's curriculum framework and also developed science language assessments so we could measure whether or not the students were developing the academic language that was needed to be successful in science. In our this particular study, 
study, we also examined the effects not only on our English learners, but also on native English speakers and former English learners who are in those classes. We uh, continued to provide on-site coaching, and we also had um, SIAP professional development for the teachers. I have a little um, sort of caveat there, as you see at the end of that final bullet, where it, the PD and the coaching was controlled by the teachers and the principals, and in particular the principals. We had some principals who were eager to have the coaches come in and others who weren't. And when you do a randomized experiment, you don't always get the schools and the teachers that are um, excited about participating in a research study, and this was certainly true in, in some of the schools where we worked here. Just to share with you some of those findings, uh, in the Bilingual Research Journal you can find a report on how the students were doing with regard to the science language um, assessments. And our SIAP group outperformed the control group, so that was again <laughs> good news for, for SIAP. We did have two types of, in principle, two types of questions on the assessments. One was an essay a couple of essays that students wrote, and the others were multiple choice questions that more closely monitored, matched, I mean, the um, state assessments they were um, having as well. And there was statistically significant difference on the writing, on the essays that the SIOP students were writing. And the difference was, on the multiple choice questions, was approaching statistical significance, but it did not meet it. What I should say is, in this particular study, though, we only had um, instruction for the students for six months. So it was... Um, quite shortened from what we would have liked to have seen, and we um, were pretty confident that if we had had the whole year, we would have seen um, statistical significance on both um, aspects of the assessments. We also looked at teacher implementation, and this was another really critical thing, because how important is it that a teacher implements the SIOP well? Well, in this particular study, we found that for any teacher who had a high uh, implementation level rating on the SIOP protocol, the students performed better. And in some cases, these were control teachers, um, because they had had training in integrating language and content instruction in other ways, either as an undergraduate or other kinds of workshops that they had, but it really made a difference. High implementing teachers led to higher student achievement, and I can't emphasize that enough, that fidelity really does matter here. And again, we looked at the performance of all of our subgroups of students, so everybody benefited from the SIOP uh, instruction, not just the English learners, but also the former English learners, the native English speakers, and the students who had disabilities, which was a small group. I'm going to turn this over to Jen now to tell you about how we're working with SIOP um, at present time. Okay. So, okay, as Debbie mentioned, we are here in the present. So as the research bears out, you have to make sure the intervention you invest in has proven positive effects on students, and SIAP is an excellent example of that. We have um, some <laughs> pictures of some of our SIAP studies, uh, articles from st certain SIAP studies here. All right. And there's some popping up. <laughs> So the ones that I just um, put up are for other um, other researchers. So not only are the researchers that developed the model looking at its efficacy, we have lots of other researchers doing the same. All right, so in thinking about the present, so if we're thinking about a quality, comprehensive SIOP professional development program design, we want to see time given to introducing teachers to the model. So usually this is done over six to eight workshop days that we can spread out through over maybe one to two years. Sometimes it's helpful to go with the goers when you're thinking about initiating um, a SIOP professional development 
program. And so we may start with the teachers who really see the need for the professional development in their classrooms. And they're also very open to this idea of transforming their practice so that their English learners can achieve more. We also think and have seen that classroom observations um, where we can work with teachers and share our thoughts, get them to share with us their thoughts on how implementation is working, that can engender professional learning, as well as providing um, teachers with time to plan their lessons and also support, so maybe through our guided lesson design, we could help teachers with that. We also recommend, and this is really where the rubber meets the road, the on-site coaching and feedback, um, giving teachers time to try it out and talk about what's working well, what challenges they have, and having someone to troubleshoot with during that, that time. And of course, collaborative teacher groups like professional learning communities can really further um, professional learning in the SIAP model. And we also encourage districts and schools to really think about um, their plan. So where are they right now with regards to how well they're meeting the needs of their English learners and then think about where they want to be in two years, in four years, in five years, and set some benchmarks um, and really evaluate how that's going so that they can refine the SIAP program as they need to. These are some typical topics that are covered in a SIAP professional development program. We want teachers to have a strong understanding of how a second language is acquired in the classroom. We also want to have a lot of fo focus and emphasis on academic language, particular to the content areas, whether that be physical education or science or math. Of course, the teachers need to have a very strong understanding of what the eight components look like, what they look like in classroom implementation, uh, why they exist in the SIAP model in general, and then what are some ways that they can begin to incorporate instructional techniques that meet each component. Of course, we want to give teachers lots of time to lesson plan and to unit plan and think about how they can integrate content and language objectives and how they can scaffold their, their activities so that t students are meeting both the content and the language goals of a lesson. And, and of course, teachers who have been doing SIAP for a while, it's always good to have a little refresher. So we might do you know, review and renew on some of the areas they want more information on, whether that be rigorous vocabulary instruction or maybe just how to better promote peer-to-peer -peer interaction. And we can't forget the people who support our educators, our coaches, and our administrators. Uh, looping them into the professional development is crucial. So we've been thinking about the research behind the SIAP model and what are some examples of good professional development designs where teachers learn about SIAP. So we wanted to show you what a SIAP classroom looks like. Uh, so in a moment, we're going to um, show a video. These are co-teachers. They're second grade teachers, and they're implementing SIOP for their second graders. The topic of the lesson is a life cycle of a butterfly. And so as you watch this lesson, it's very brief, the, sec the segment we're going to show, we'd like you to think about uh, what were the content language objectives, how were the objectives presented and then shared with the students, how did the teachers assure that the students understood what was expected of them out of the lesson, uh, how did our teachers make input comprehensible for all of their learners? And then in what ways did the teachers emphasize key vocabulary? So this is for all of the students, not just the English learners, but you'll see this classroom also contains many, um, what we might say, English-only students. All right. So oh. as before I show that, I did want to help you organize your thinking. You know, in SIOP, we love graphic organizers. And so here's another one that you could use um, yourself, but you could also use it here to look at the video. We call it the WOWs, Wonders, and What Ifs, the WWW organizer. And so as you're watching the teachers, what you could think about are the WOWs, like the things that caught your eye about the lesson. You could also have questions for the teachers, like, I won, you know, why did she do this, or who are her students? And we could also have what ifs, and those are our constructive um, feedback, so maybe suggestions that we might have for the teachers in moving forward. And so here's an example um, of what that might look like if you're filling this out. And you can see in the um, webinar that there are handouts, and so this is one of the handouts. So WW Organizer, you can download that. Um, use it for yourself now, but also use it for your students or for the teachers who you support. So here's an example of a filled out one. So, wow, I really like how I use that simple graphic organizer to scaffold student writing. A wonder might be, I wonder which students um, are the English learners in the class. And then a what if 
could be something like, well, what if he used a word bank to teach the key vocab that he wanted the students to use when they were talking about their posters? So those are some examples of our wows and our wonders and our what ifs. So what we'd like you to do after we show the video is maybe post a few of your owns in the questions box in the GoToWebinar window. So you can just say, wow, blank, 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 or what if X, Y, Z. That's one way to do this. All right, so if we are ready, I'm going to go ahead and play that video for us. We would like you to read the content objective in your head, and then we'll read it out loud together. Today we will be able to create and label the butterfly life cycle. Good. We have labeled things in here before. Think back to when we did our maps at the beginning of the year. You label your maps. Turn to your table and tell them, what does label mean? What does it mean when you label something? So when you're labeling, what do you mean? You're writing. Good idea. What does that mean when we label? Guys, when you when you labeled your maps, what were you doing? You wrote the James River, the Mississippi River. What were you doing when you labeled those rivers? See, you wrote the maps. The names of the rivers. Good, that's a good idea. Okay. Good, buddy. What else have you labeled in here? What? Oh, okay, very nice. And you also labeled your continents when you did your maps, right? So we're going to be labeling the butterfly life cycle. What words are we going to be using? You could name teachers, right? What would you label me as? You would label... Sure, you could label teachers. No, I'm not sure. Good, so what would you guys think of another a synonym for label? Who would like to share a synonym for label that you talked about at your table? Jeffrey, what did you talk about? something and today we're going to write in order to label our life cycle. Good job. Let's take a look at our language objective. Read it in your head first. All right, let's read our language objective. Today we will be able to write about the stages of the butterfly life cycle. Good, so our job today is going to include a lot of writing. Good. All right. So thank you for bearing with us um, on the video. Hopefully you saw some of what we were hoping to show tonight. Um, this is our time to go ahead and go into the questions box and indicate what some of our wows are, our wonders, and our what ifs. And then Debbie and I will kind of synthesize those and share them out with you all. All right, so please go ahead and do that. What were some things that you noticed about the way the teachers presented objectives? All right, so I have, I wonder if those videos are captioned. That's a good question. They, they are not, unfortunately, um, but uh, we'll, we'll see what we can do because um, that would be helpful. Uh, so one wow is that she, um, she gave an example of what label was and that she linked it to past learning and social studies. Another wow is uh, making the connections to the kids previous experiences and other um, assignments that they've done in class. Another wow is how the objectives included teaching vocabulary and reference prior learning, which is so important. Right? These teachers really use the objectives not just as a time to set the goals, but also to do some instruction, which I think is super important when we're thinking about how to make sure we have a, a valid or reliable routine for having um, objectives shared. Another is uh, they love how all the students read the objectives together and that um, the students actually had some time to understand the objectives. So that if you notice the teachers 
said, okay, read it in your head, and then we're going to read it out loud. And that would be super helpful for English learners. All right. And another wonder. I wonder if the students in the group were working without teacher prompts, also were having structured talk. Oh, that, that's a good, that's a good wonder. I wonder that too. <laughs> All right. So thank you so much. So hopefully you saw with the www chart that this is a way that we can um, summarize maybe a class presentation, uh, maybe from a gallery walk. The students can use a www chart to evaluate their peers. It's also a way for you as a teacher to give feedback. And I know that as a teacher educator, we can use um, an activity like this with our teachers when we're having them try out new things. And it's a very safe um, space to kind of explore implementation. So we also have teachers um, in our side workshops think about how they could modify these activities because what we're showing you here is, is not always um, your instructional context. So we could think a little bit like how could you modify this activity to make it more appropriate for your learners. Um, if you have some ideas, we would love to hear about them by going to the questions box in the GoToWebinar. Um, as you do that, I want to show you one modification that um, we've thought about, which is sentence stems. So if we want to have our students use the academic language, we might want to give them a little push. And so that could be um, a sentence stem or a sentence frame, depending on the student's language proficiency. So if this was for teachers. We could say, I like the way, or it was effective, or I wonder what, or I wonder how. Or what if you enhance the lesson by? So those are some examples that we've thought of. But we would be super curious to hear about what you think. So let's see here. Um, I've got adding visuals to each column. That would be an excellent idea. We could show, we could have pictures to help some of our students. Are there any other ideas for modifying this activity? All right. Well, we might come back to this in the interest of time. We're going to go ahead. Oops, and we have, oh, okay. Um, I love sentence stems and frames, me too. It helps English learners get their thinking started um, Oh, while, while writing on a whiteboard. So that would be, that's another good idea. Thank you. All right, so I wanted to quickly synthesize some of the things that um, Debbie and I have been talking about. So hopefully, as you can see, time is super important when we're helping our teachers get good at SIOP. Um, it takes you know one to two years for teachers to be comfortable and you start seeing implementation with some regularity in the classroom. To jumpstart that though, we could provide you know our ongoing job embedded training like our workshops, our lessons, uh, lesson labs, um, collaborative groups, things like that. We also hopefully you've seen that you have to measure teacher implementation before we can start thinking about well what is the effect that's having on student performance. We've first have to see that teachers are using the SIAP model consistently. And so that's important. As Debbie said, fidelity matters. Uh, we also want to analyze the implementation of SIAP in our schools and districts because that's the way that we're going to refine our professional development. We might decide to do uh, very targeted workshops based on certain features that teachers really struggle with. And so if you're constantly collecting that data, that will help you do that. Of course, we want to focus on the academic language of individual subject areas. We want to help teachers learn about how do you teach the language of math, the language of social studies. Um, and then, of course, the goal of any professional development is that it impacts our students. And so that's something we have to think about. All right, so our last poll going here. So we're heading into the future. This is SIOP 2.0. So where do we go from here? We're super curious. What do you all think? Um, what are some ideas you have? And there's a quick poll coming up. So please choose um, all that apply. Okay, so 
looking at our poll results, <laughs> we see that uh, expanding SIOP to other teaching contexts is a large uh, percentage, more than two-thirds of you think that would be important to do in the future. Enhancing the SIOP PD, doing some work on education policy, I'd, I know we'd all love to be do advocacy work, but it's tough, isn't it? Conduct more research. Um, maybe, maybe not. There's about a quarter of you that think we should do that. And uh, we didn't have anybody put anything in with the other category. But I'm sure you'll think of things, and you can let us know as we go on. So um, one of the, what we would like to talk about are those first four, obviously, that we put into the poll. And just to start with the policies, we know that the future is, is showing a new policy for us, right? We are um, now working under ESSA. Title I has the re accountability level for um, the students. And we still have uh, standards that they are going to have to meet, at least in most states, at least in the current um, configuration of how uh, federal funding is coming. Coming, um, to the districts through the states. The um, SIOP continues to be uh, an effective way to teach all state standards to students. Anytime you have content and second language learners, you can use the SIOP model. So whether your state is a common core state, a TEKS state, an SOL state, a New York City <laughs> standards uh, area, um, you can use the SIOP model to teach the standards. And then in terms of the testing, one of the things that that is a little bit different in ESSA is that we're going to continue to monitor the students for four years, not for two years after they exit the program. So their scores will be included in the SIOP, uh, sorry, <laughs> in the ESL cohort, the English learner cohort. And that hopefully will also be a way to show that the programs are effective and that the students are doing well when they are in the mainstream um, classrooms. The other piece of education policy, many of you have probably seen this Dear Colleague letter that came out last Jan a year ago, January, almost two years now, from the Department of Justice and the Depart Education Department. And in this colleague letter, they are reminding districts of their responsibilities to serve English language learners well. And two of the things that come up frequently is the notion that the students have to be given opportunities to develop academic language, not just social language and they have to have access to grade level content. And we know that the SIOP model will continue to help teachers meet those requirements from the federal case law. In terms of SIOP 2.0 for all, we see that it can work for all students and teachers. In our research, we began with just looking at the English learners, but we added on and looked at um, the native English speakers, dual language students, former English learners, and so forth. And certainly all teachers can learn to be SIOP teachers. We also see that it works across all program models, an ESL program, a bilingual program, a dual language program, a newcomer program, a general ed program. It's uh, one of the things that's great about SIOP is that if it's done well, students are engaged with learning. They're interacting, they're talking, they're listening, they're speaking, they're writing, they're on task, which is also very important. The other thing is the school levels. We've done research K-12, but I would argue that SIOP can move into post-secondary, not just in terms of teacher education, where of course we would love all pre-service teachers to learn about SIOP, but also for community college. I think SIOP has a, a great um, it, there's a great opportunity to do more SIOP instruction at the community college level and at adult education levels. In terms of the research topics, the, the researcher in me has a few things that she would love to do, and <laughs> maybe we can find some ways to get funding for these. But one is to actually measure student effects after the PSYOP PD has been well implemented. In all of our studies to date, the ones that we've conducted here at Cal and some of our colleagues elsewhere, the we're starting to collect student data while teachers are learning the model. And very rarely do we have an opportunity to collect that data after the teachers have learned the model to see the really um, the positive effects of, of PSYOP instruction. We'd also like to do more longitudinal studies of students to really track how students have done over time. Because often we see a student for a year or two in a research study, but we don't know what happens later on. Are they successful? Are they staying in school? Are they graduating with honors, for example?
The PD options is another uh, place to look at research. What types of PD works best, maybe for different types of um, school levels, maybe for different content areas, maybe just uh, based on teacher choice. We could also do some case studies of implementation and find out effective ways that different districts have implemented the SIOP model because we know there's no one size fits all that fits when it comes to the implementation. And we'd also like to look at SIOP and how it can help long-term English learners. This is a growing subpopulation that we have in our schools. And I know we're looking for effective programs and practices for these students, and SIOP just might be the, the answer. Finally, we're going to talk a little bit about SIOP PD. And I'll let Jen take on this uh, slide. All right. So we have SIOP 2.0 2 PD. So um, one would be teacher agency. How do students direct their own professional learning development? There's a lot about pers personalized learning for our students. We should do that for um, our educators as well. That also might lead to choice. So maybe how the professional development is delivered. Do, do they perform more large group options or small group online, um, a mixed hybrid? We could also look at the type of support. Teachers may prefer to do that in teams. Um, with critical friends or across grade levels. We could also look at this idea of lab schools um, or learning labs, learning instructional walks to help with um, implementation. SIOP could be part of every teaching credential program. I think that sounds like a wonderful idea. And then also SIOP as part of every administrator training program so that our administrators understand what we need from them to ensure that our ELs have access to content and language. Um, so lastly, we do have uh, no time <laughs> for questions. We do apologize, but you have our contact info, um, and we're, we're more than happy to answer your questions um, a little bit later. Also, we do want to direct you to the fact that we have handouts. Um, there are briefs there and um, summary of the SIOP research, and I think that might be very helpful. So lastly, let's see, did we meet our objectives? I usually have teachers wrap on the table to indicate if, they, if we met that, but since uh, I can't hear that tonight, we'll just say, did you develop a deeper understanding of the SIOP model as an effective tool for lesson planning and teaching English learners? We hope uh, that was something that came through. Um, and also, were you able to utilize knowledge of the SIOP model and what constitutes effective professional development to support SIOP? I think, I think we showed some examples of that through the research and through current professional development. Lastly, language. Were you able to summarize in writing the main points of SIOP? I feel like several of us, many of us, were able to do that. And then were you able to observe, listen to, and reflect on instructional practices? practices um, that promote content and academic language acquisition. And I, I think we were able to do that, even though the video um, messed up a little bit, we were able to do that. So thank you.